if you remember December or January of this year, it seemed like the global economy was slowing down. To what degree do you characterize COVID thing as an accelerator of, of these trends that we've been seeing before? Or to what degree do you, do you characterize as a, as a kind of a shift in, in, in global business? I would say that Corona exacerbates trends. First of all, accelerates trends, of course, the stay at home economy, but it always also exacerbate trends. Like many companies will now realize, wow, we are just as productive with 70% of people that we have, or maybe even less and 80% of them working from home. We don't need to you know, have that much office space. So this has a lot of different knock-on effects. However, I will warn, like I write in my book too, perhaps the economy and our society um, are complex self-organizing systems. And now we are, we've been so overwhelmed by latest developments. And now we think linearly, we think, you know, everything is gonna be this horrible forever and it's gonna go down this trajectory and nothing will change. Of course, you know, things are gonna change in unforeseen ways. But we must realize that digitization was already on its way, that artificial intelligence had made quantum leaps, supercomputing. These are things that, you know, while we live our lives, we don't even realize. I'm currently writing my second book and I've done more research. I was actually I'm relatively well informed, but I was pretty shocked to see how far many developments had already progressed. One of them, um, apart from things that may seem exotic like artificial intelligence, it's just simple digitization and a contract worker working. This is not just people working from home or working from job to job. This is big monopolistic companies like tech companies, but others outsourcing, but not like they used to be to low wage companies, you know, emerging countries, but to people all over the world, contract workers. So for instance, Google, 50% of its employees are only employees, classic employees on the payroll with all benefits. 50% of them are already contract workers. They wear the uniforms, they have the business cards, you wouldn't know. And this is a development Google, that's Google I mentioned, but like Big Bang, Banks of America, Federal Express, all these big companies. So this is a development that is gaining steam now, of course, um, the platform economy, basically has the same business model where risks are outsourced to workers who have no control and companies have all the knowledge about the business model and the worker. The fact that these people don't have benefits, no pensions, nothing in the bank, no secure job, all the risk is that on their end, the social contract has been upended, mostly in the US, but you know, other countries, you see a cracks too. So there are, I would say digitization and artificial intelligence are causing tectonic shifts that are much more fundamental than just economic. They have profound implications on our whole society and our, on our lives. And young people who graduate from high school or college today will probably have to change their jobs, careers, many times their lifetimes over and also their skill sets. Now there, there, I mean, it's a very long answer to a, a concise question, but it's just, you know, many complex developments coming together. Well, the question was pretty general, so don't worry about it. <laughs> um, what ways of doing business will eventually go back in your, in your predictions? Go back to to how it was when we consider a normal pre-COVID um, doing business world. And what, what permanent uh, post-COVID uh, changes do you envision from now? Well, going back to the point that many jobs will be partially at least digitized, I think what we will see more and more is, you know, humans, and machi many jobs will not be entirely taken over by machines, but humans need to work more closely with machines. Everything that can be translated into algorithms will be increasingly done by computers. So now it's not just um, 
assembly line workers, or blue collar work, like doctors, lawyers, tax advisors, all these people um, increasingly work with machines. So this is one development that will that was in the pipeline anyway. I think more people will be able to work from home, which is probably a good development. Many people are grateful for that. Many people are going crazy. So I think there'll also be a trend towards going back to the office. And like I said, I was in New York and you can just sense people are itching to go back to their old lives. And I think we will find ways to live with the pandemic with you know, protections and medication, whatever else. Because also I think if you ask me, well, what are humans to do if machines take over? I would say the biggest competitive advantage that we have is our being human. Our emotional intelligence and our social skills are the last qualities that will be digitized and be able to be performed by machines if ever. And people will very quickly realize the people who are actually in the office, the people who interact with their bosses, the people who can be on the front lines and actually try to acquire new clients will be more successful. I love the Zoom call, but people are getting tired. They are, you know, they crave personal interaction. Mm -hmm. They want to go to conferences. And I think as soon as that's possible, it won't go back to like it was before, but probably to a larger extent than we fear right now. So I think that is coming back. But all in all, I think we all must factor in that our jobs will change. Also of, of journalists, you know, many jobs are also being performed by by computers, by um, supercomputers. So, um, so I think we all need to be more agile, flexible. We need to disrupt ourselves, just like companies need to dis disrupt themselves, and just live with this. Li learn to live with this uncertainty. Mm -hmm. Is the the process of digitization everything, uh, almost everything? Can we turn it into into uh, into our advantage as humans? Absolutely. I mean, uh, I forget which tech CEO it was. Oh, Salesforce. Mark Benioff said, technology is neither good nor bad. It's what we make of it, obviously. And I think that, you know, I, I wrote in my book about the financial elite, which used to, you know, pull the threads of, the, of what was going on. And I think increasingly more in, in recent years, their place has been taken over by tech companies. They're the new monopolists, the new industrialists. And like Amazon is taking over first, it started with books, then merchandise, then streaming services, other services, it's going into financial services, uh, transportation, um, all areas, food, of course, supermarkets. So, um, they're becoming increasingly more powerful. And, um, and so I think because they have all the money, they're mostly intertwined with politics. I, mean, I don't think it's as bad here in, in Europe, but in the US, they have the deepest pockets, like the earliest investor in Facebook, Peter Thiel. It's very close to Peter Thiel Palantir, which is a very important yeah. military funded originally mm -hmm. data firm. Um, and then, of course, uh, Mark Zuckerberg is chummy with the Trump administration. Tim Cook walks a very fine line, very diplomatically. And no matter who's in power, they'll latch on and they have all the money. And with their money, uh, one chapter of my book is we have the best democracy money can buy. And it's not really what's going on in secret behind the scenes. What's really insidious is what's going on out in the open. Lobbyism. The... Um, you know, people going back between the public and private sector, all these things that are actually legal. Um, money and politics is the biggest problem in the US. So I think I'm a little concerned that politics doesn't have an answer to these technological changes. Granted, it's difficult. Um, even in Germany, it's not ideal. You know, politics is short term and these developments are long term, so there's a conflict. But Steve Mnuchin, the finance minister in the US, has said that. Uh, oh, uh, digitization and robots, that's a development that's like 80 or 100 years out that doesn't even concern us. So they have no answers. They don't want to look at it and they monetize probably the knowledge that they have. So with rising inequality in the United States and the social unrest that we're seeing increasingly more, I'm very, very worried that actually I will say I had 
a conversation with a tech titan that opened my eyes in New York. It was by chance. I had no idea who was coming by. It was rather, you know, innocuous kind of guy. Started talking. I was like, wow, we could very quickly realize this is a, a brilliant person. And my brain, after a few minutes, couldn't even process what he was telling me. But the bottom line was, who like, what me? they are... Hmm? Uh, excuse me, who, who was uh, this uh, man? I don't want to say the name. You may not even know him, but he works for one of the biggest tech conglomerates uh -huh. and he's in charge of their artificial AI. So everybody mm -hmm. in the space will know him. I had not heard his name before, but yeah, um, yeah he's written a well, lot, doesn't matter. But anyway, yeah. the bottom line of what he was telling was we have groundbreaking um, inventions in the pipeline Many of them aren't even public yet. You wouldn't be able to fathom. He threw out some things, but I get, like I said, I couldn't even process. Mm -hmm. And uh, there, the way that society is going to structure itself is there is, you know, this minuscule elite. At least now we have the one percent and ninety-nine percent. This is like the super mini elite, and then all the rest of us. And not only will we be exploited, like now are the Uber drivers and you know all the platform economy workers. But they will become superfluous because then we have self-driving cars and they're not even necessary. What, what, what are people going to do if they're not needed for anything anymore? So I think, yeah, I think we need more leadership. And um, I think it's all our job to put pressure on politicians to make this happen because it's not going to happen by itself. Mm -hmm. has, this, has this been already decided about? <laughs> this conspiracy that um, we just explained? <laughs> I don't think it's a conspiracy. It's like well, I write about yeah. complex self-organizing systems and they have the monopolistic power, which mm -hmm. is network effects. The more power you have, the more power you get, the more money you have, the more you'll get. And with their technological advances, like you and I, we what are we can't keep up with that mm -hmm. normal people. So it's this teeny weeny silicon elite, and we all rely on this new world on this new way of life with ordering with Amazon, having Zoom calls. So we are actually giving our power away willingly because it's so inexpensive and so convenient, but in, they end up with all this power. So it's kind of self-perpetuating. It's not like a conspiracy. It's just, but we could, of course, I also write any system that doesn't balance, every system after a while becomes more homogeneous and more connected whether it's an ecological system, like an you know, ant colony, anything in the environment, or a man-made system, like a computer system. Mm -hmm. And so after a while, it becomes imbalanced. And then corrective mechanisms kick in to balance out the system again. And we have disabled corrective mechanisms, for instance, in the financial world, mm -hmm. so or in politics. So because we have disabled these, this, our system is becoming more and more skewed, like with inequality. And if, we're, if we don't do anything, that's just the way it's going to go.